Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support also helps us to continue to share this message of grace, peace, and Christ's righteousness in the finished work of the cross. You can give online at cokerministries.com or you can mail your support to or prayer requests to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parkers Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. Remember, if you are in Christ, you are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed. Just as a reminder that uh, Joy and I, our, our ministry is real simple. It's, our heart is simply to make Jesus bigger in your life and the resurrection more powerful more effective and um, we trust the Holy Spirit as being the great teacher our job is not to convince you what we know is right but to challenge what's in your head and get your head moving around your brain working so then the the great teacher can take your brain where he wants you to take you and um, so uh, we're just gonna pray real quick and ask the great we're gonna honor him as the teacher you only get in your life what you honor. You only get what you honor. Another powerful truth is, uh, I know we make a big, and we need to make a big deal about the anointing, about prayer, intercession, uh, the things of the Spirit. The one thing that I've seen time and time again that has made the, the biggest, quickest difference in a person's life is simply being thankful. It's a misunderstood gift. It's a misunderstood power. It gives you access to so many things. And it, you can tell if you're thankful for something if you take care of it. If, if you don't take care of your marriage, that means you're not thankful for your marriage. Ooh, if you don't take care of your car, that means you're not thankful for your car. Thankfulness... You, the very essence of thankfulness is honor. If you honor something, you can give it a value and you're going to be thankful for it. You're going to take care of it. You're going to uh, be gracious. So Father, we thank you for this opportunity to get us to gather together in this place. Holy Spirit, you truly are the great teacher. We humble ourselves before you tonight. We surrender our information that we've gleaned over the years. We simply ask that you do what you do best. Open the eyes of our understanding. Yes. Bring to the spirit of wisdom and revelation according to your word. And all God's people said? Amen. Amen, amen and amen. I saw, I, I saw a title. It was Christmas and then it was mess. Dash mess. And it's just the mess of Christmas. And... Uh, we're going to talk about I encourage you. I mean, I know you have plans for tomorrow. Uh, if you can be here tomorrow morning for breakfast, we will. Uh, we were go, we're going to go places that you didn't think you were able to go to. Talk about some things that you didn't know was even out there to talk about. Uh, uh, and if you know places that we don't bring up that we don't, you, you bring them up and we'll talk about those. Uh, dealing with, uh, there's there's three basic scriptures that came across my heart. Amongst all the scriptures, and you wouldn't think these are Christmas scriptures, and they're really not, but we're going to apply them that way. And one is that Jesus said himself, the traditions of men make the word of God of no effect. And that's going to be one of our focuses for tonight and mostly tomorrow. Uh, you need to be here tomorrow. It's really going to be informational based. Uh, I, we just tried doing a meeting in Wilmer, trying to mix the two together, the inspiration and the, the information, and it, it just didn't 
it didn't flow real well, so turned I'm going to turn into perspiration. Yeah, it <laughs> yeah, it was pretty hot in there too. We were, in a, we were in a garage that was turned into a pottery place, you know, where they have big kiln and it was pretty hot. Yeah, that's awesome. yeah, yeah, I know. It was pretty neat being there with the potter. Anyway, and uh, so the, the one scripture that I want you to think about is the traditions of man will make the Word of God no effect, and we're going to go into the Word and see what the Word of God says about the season we're in. And the contradiction that our traditions have given us. And see why, or see really what the message is, and what it is. Because we've missed the message in the mess. The church has created a mess. And they're not sharing the message. Because of the traditions of men. And uh, another scripture that. I find very appropriate for the season we're in is Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And we'll talk more about this in detail tomorrow, but uh, we need to understand. He didn't say beware. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. We need to understand that there was a group of people. There were Pharisees, Sadducees, they're different groups. There used to be a group called the Essenes. And... Uh, and uh, you, you might, if, to help you understand what these groups, it's almost like den denominations. You know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, uh, political based. You know, they were more concerned about the political aspects of Israel and Rome, the connections. Uh, another one was really uh, oral law based. The oral, you know, the Talmud, you first mentioned the Talmud and the Mishnah. They were, they were written laws, but the written laws that were there were the oral laws that they had written down. They weren't written word from the past. The Essenes, uh, they were uh, a group of people, or a denomination, if you want to call it that, uh, 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 more based on righteousness. That was their focus. The Essenes were a group of people who believed what you and I believe today about Jesus. They believed that Jesus, that the Messiah was coming. It was season for the Messiah. They knew that. They were anticipating. All the prophecies about Jesus, they believed, anticipated. We believe that they knew that Jesus was the Messiah. And one reason we can show that is, is what happened to the Essenes after AD 30. No one hears of them. You know why? They're no longer around. You know why? They were the first Jewish Christians. They believed the prophetic word. Jesus came on the scene and they believed Jesus and they became the first followers of Christ. John the Baptist was one, right? John the Baptist was an Essene that was, and remember Jerusalem, the, the church sent a group of people to see if John the Baptist was the Messiah. Everybody at this period of time was looking, all the prophecies people, I'm sorry, I'm trying not to get, God, I guess they go. All the prophecies were leading up to this point in time. And tomorrow morning we're going to talk about why there's so much confusion about the birth of Jesus, about the uh, why some people believe this, some people believe that. There's actually three major thoughts about when Jesus was born. We're going to talk about why that really doesn't matter. <laughs> and uh, But uh, when they came to see if John the Baptist, they said, John the Baptist, are you him? Meaning the Messiah. And he says, there's one coming that I'm not worthy to even uh, tie his shoes. Oh, and all, by the way, there he is. And he pointed to Jesus. You know, and, and that's how, I mean, everybody was looking for the Messiah coming. And that's the beautiful thing about the message of Christmas is that you can't help. When we get done tomorrow, oh my goodness. If... if, if and we try to tell people, um, you know, that there's a group of, you know, I'll finish that. I'll finish that thought. The the leaven of the Pharisees. Leaven isn't always sin. In Scripture, there's one Scripture, one verse that Jesus said, "The kingdom of heaven is like leaven." A woman had three mills, three lumps of bread, and she leavened all three lumps. That's it. 
So it wasn't about sin. The leaven was referred to the kingdom. And so when Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, you've got to stop and think about what a Pharisee was. It was a group of people that were more interested in the legalities of Scripture instead of the heart of Scripture. You know, it was like a church wanting to be the, the rightest church in town, but the least loving and caring. You know, the, the knowledge of the tree of good and evil was what produced the right and wrong thinking. God didn't even want us to have that. He said, don't touch that tree. Don't eat that tree. I don't want you to have the ability to think right and wrong, good and evil. He wanted us to live free of that. And see, that's what, well, that's what religion is all about, is being right and wrong. That's why church splits are always happy because it's always about right or wrong, right or wrong, who's right, who's wrong. It's about being righteous. It's a higher call than right or wrongness. And uh, in our life, being righteous is what we should really be uh, living in and experiencing every day because we already are in Christ Jesus. And so the Pharisees weren't that way. The Pharisees knew Scripture, but they didn't know the truth. Why? How do we know that? It says it in Scripture. Jesus said, if you were my disciples, you'd know the truth. And the truth would set you free. And they went, ah! How can you say we don't know truth? We're the descendants of Abraham. We've never been in bondage to anybody. But well, that's how they knew. They, they didn't know the truth because when were they not in bondage? Yeah. At that time, they're in bondage to Rome. You know, I can think of Egypt, Babylon. I mean, when weren't they in bondage? You know, and, and so we need to understand fairy, the, the spirit of a Pharisee is someone who has information with no heart. Did you hear that? Yeah. There were people that had heart. At that time, they're in bondage to Rome. Hey, Amen. That's good preaching right there. It's too. I'm not going to be going with that coming across there. Okay. And so, what we need to understand, a Pharisee, we said, beware the the. And there's so many people in this season that are making such big deals and some need to be made about the issues around Christmas, like the day. Well, it's not December 20th. How many people know Jesus wasn't born? I, I, I mean, and they get spiritual. They act spiritual. Well, back in, uh, back in the day when... when uh, oh gosh, there goes his name. Um, what? Herod? Not Herod. Back in the day. Oh, the mixed of Constantine. Constantine. Oh, no. When Constantine took the pagan religion and brought it in, uh, they believe anyway that Constantine took the pagan religion, a uh, celebration, and Christianity, Christmas, and mixed them together and said, December. Uh, just keep going back further. You realize that Christmas on the 25th was being celebrated by the early churches as early as 150, as late, uh, back as 150 A.D., 100 years before Constantine? Wow. Oh, it's pagan, it's pagan. Calm down. God showed me this. I just had this little glimpse of a revelation. Uh, how many days did God make it to creation? Six. What? Six. 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 Seven. Oh, seven. 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 But he still made it. He had to have, make it on the seventh and rest it on the seventh. He was done after six. It was, well, no, I said, how many days did he make? <laughs> he made seven. Seven days. Well, he made seven. And, and there was, seven. and that seven day, that's. <laughs> oh no! Oh, I, Ferris experience. Just, <laughs> no. Well, you really messed me up, Carol. Come on. And so let me get back on track here. Uh, so that seven-day cycle has done nothing but repeat itself. There hasn't been any more days made. There's just been seven, and every one of them, God said it was good. One of them, He said it was very good because man showed up. How many days did the pagans make? No. What? No. The pagans didn't make any day. You need to realize that. Pagan, they hijacked days. Oh. All they've ever done is hijack. 
hijacked. Just like they've done with the rainbow. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I can see it 500 years from now. Bible studies going all over. You can't say America because it probably won't be here to be some other kind of thing. And the few Christians that are going to be left are going to say, man, that rainbow, that's a, that's a symbol of the devil. Because back in the day, the gays had it. <laughs> well, who made it? Who used it first? Just because some group of people hijack what God did doesn't mean it's an evil rainbow. Let me let me show you my, my case here. Bats. You may not like them, but did the devil make them? Who made them? They fly at night and that makes you scared and they're really ugly. Right? Well, don't look around. No, never mind. Don't make them around. Ugly is not a sign of the devil, okay? Say everybody, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. That's all I can say. Okay? But yet, the occult took them and used them as symbols, but now we think they're evil. How about darkness? Ooh, witchcraft makes in darkness, and, you know, it's a secret, and it's all dark. Hey, well, who, who made the darkness? Uh, the pagans didn't make anything. They hijacked it. Meditation. Oh, you can't do that. That's Eastern mysticism. Ooh, that's evil. No, no, look in the Word of God. It says to meditate on these. It's not new age, it's old age. God, the Word of God has been telling us to meditate on these things. Eastern mysticism is blanking out your mind and hoping something comes in. Godly meditation is focusing on Him. See, seeing yourself healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, loving your enemies. If you can't see yourself loving your enemies, you'll never do it. No matter even if Jesus told you to do it. Why? Because He's not your rabbi. Your rabbi has been some denomination. Ooh. See, if Jesus is a rabbi, you don't... See, when, someone, when you have a rabbi, you don't have an opinion. You've got to give it up. You have to deal with your issues. You can't cover them up. That's what being a... Disciple of a rabbi means questions. Oh yeah, yeah. What questions. questions? Oh yeah, questions. That's what forms conversations and creates the. How many times does it say to, to to think on these things to to be of one mind? You know, we have to be. You know, we're all divided over, and there's all kinds of what do you want to call it? Traditions of men that keep us divided. There's all kinds of leaven of the Pharisees that creeps into our own heart and our own ego. Say ego. ego. The most powerful force in your body is not the spirit, it's your ego. I said it in your body. You know, once you deal with that and let the Holy Spirit, but you still have to bring death to your ego. You got to die to yourself. And, uh, and, and so there's things that affect us. The, People that say, well, I know this, I know that, but where's their heart? Where's their love for people? Where's their, where's their love for righteousness? They might be right according to Scripture, but you can be absolutely totally wrong when it comes to people. Man, Jesus was against the Pharisees. Wow. And so the two things we're talking about tonight is the traditions of men. The leaven of the Pharisees. And the other scripture we're going to talk about is in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Put verse 2 on the board there, Joy. For I'm jealous for you now. I've got to get past this. this. This is a real powerful verse. If you've never heard us teach on this. For I'm jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as chaste virgin to Christ. Here's the verse. But I fear, at least somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the what? Simplicity. Simplicity. That is in Christ. The, Chris, the Christmas story really is just so simple. There are a lot of factual information around it that can help us understand really what God was doing in the behind the scenes that we as Americans don't understand because we've taken things out of context. 
Now, when you take the Christmas story or any of God's Word out of context, when you take the text out of the context, what are you left with? Con. You're, le you're left with a con. I believe that's where the church is at today with most of the understanding of the Christmas story. And that's why tonight is going to be a inspirational and the morning will be in informational. And there's going to be some information we talk about tonight that... Uh, yeah, I, I, I saw a picture a while back ago of a... I had an image, I didn't see a picture, uh, of a, a, a shaft, just a, a rod, and it had a bunch of lenses that were in line with this shaft, and the light was over there, and I could... The first lens was clear, and I could see the light. Simple, right? You know what I'm talking about? I could see the light. And then when this filter would come over it, even though I could see the light with it clear, this made something show up that wasn't there before because the color brought something out in the light, and I could see that now. And if I pull it back, there was another one that came in, and it was a different color, and I could see. So each one of these represented a revelation, a truth, a, so, something that God was showing me in the, from the Word. Oh, this is good. This is truth. This is revelation. And when you put it into the light, boom, wow, there it is. Move it, another one goes in there, boom, there it is. But yet when these two came together, you know when you take a blue and a red and you put it together, you come out with purple? Then a revelation came forth that this one didn't have and that this one didn't have, but when they came together, boom, there was a third revelation. And every time one of these lenses came into the picture, but it all magnified the picture that it was beautiful. It was you know, we all have pieces and parts. And there's the light and the source. And if God's behind it, it's all going to fit the same puzzle. You know, it says we, we have all these puzzle pieces, but we don't know how to put them together to make the picture work. Well, I guarantee you, tomorrow morning, I don't know if you'll be here. I'm not trying to get rid of all your eggs. but We have a lot. We've got a lot, got a lot of eggs come on. But really... You're, we're going to talk about Simone tonight, but this is really a Christmas message. And, you know, like I said earlier, that God created seven days. Uh, and, I, Joy, you can't let me go too deep with this. But all holidays, and we shared, I think we shared this last month about um, Halloween. Who was here last month? We talked about Halloween. Okay, because Halloween, if you know the story of Halloween, not, not the common day story, but let me go back to refresh your memory. Remember that the first, uh, and all this ties together, that's why we've got to talk about some of this tomorrow. There's multiple calendars, that the Jew, even the Jewish calendar that we have today is a Pharisee calendar, and it has two New Years. That's why people are all screwed up. Every, day, every time the year goes by, one, one feast or something's on a different day than it was, it's all confusing. And it's not even the right... In, in the second century A.D., uh, that calendar, that the calendar it had been using was changed to what it is today. So Jesus and Paul didn't even use the calendar that the Jews are using today. Do you understand that? It's a different calendar. It was messed up on purpose to deny the prophetic word about Jesus' first coming as Messiah and to deny His second coming as... to deny Him coming as the Lamb and deny His coming in as the King. It was done on purpose. There's a calendar prior to that called the calendar of the Essenes uh, that they use that lines up everything. To, sh to show you, how many people know the Jewish calendar is a lunar right. calendar? <laughs> It's a lunar calendar, right? Yep. Well, which which did God make first, the sun or the moon? Sun. The sun. The scene calendar, the one they had throughout history, is a solar calendar. Hmm. See? Do you think God would have used his calendar on what he made second or what he made first? Okay. And on the seven days. Matter of fact, in the Essene calendar, where everything lines up, by the way, the, the the Feast of Trumpets is on this day every day, every year. Hmm. All throughout history. It's the same day, the same time, here. Every feast is that way. It just works out. And so we have a mixture of calendars and events and dates and times. I, I just want to say one thing. 
in the Pharisee calendar, which is what the Jews use today and what every all the ministers use today as the Pharisee calendar, the year is 5782. Okay, the 57, cal- the Jew, okay, let me do this real quick. There, there's different ways of measuring the age of the earth and the age of time. Jewish people use what they know. We have B.C. and A.D., right? You understand what those are? Before Christ and... Um, and it, which actually means the day of our Lord. Meaning he was, it doesn't mean after death. It means the day of our Lord. Now, that's confusing in itself because they say Jesus was born for B.C. <laughs> Before. Okay, we won't get into that. Okay. But the Jewish calendar goes back to where cre- the creation day is day one, year one. The next year was year two, and it goes. Abraham was born on 1948 a.m. It's called Anamundi. So a.m., not a.m. as in time, but in date. So Anamundi is the phrase used for dating the world from creation on. Just to show you how this works, Abraham was created or birthed in 1948 so is a.m. Israel was birthed 1948 AD. AD. Interesting. The father of it. Never mind. If you didn't get that, you're not a Bible nerd. Okay. If you got it, you're a Bible nerd. We we can work with you. Okay. Anyway. So. So so, okay. So the Jewish, the Pharisee calendar, that they changed the dates so that the date that Jesus was on the planet did not correspond with the prophetic dates. So that calendar, the Pharisee calendar, which is wrong, says the year is 5782. 5782, write that down. 5782. The Essene calendar is the year 5946. A little bit closer to 6,000. Now, why are we saying that's so important? Because 6,000 is the year... Uh, a lot of whole things going to happen during the year 6,000 or maybe before that. So you see there's like 160 some years separating the, and, and it was strictly made so the first coming of Jesus the Messiah as the Lamb didn't line up with the prophetic and his second coming as the Lion doesn't line up. Okay? The Lion and the Lamb. So, now, just and we're, this is where we're going to get more detail in the morning, but all holidays. Stop and think about some things. Actually, according to what we're learning, holidays began with Adam in creation. Now we have never talked on scientific creationism, but how many people know anything about scientific creationism? Anybody? <laughs> I think we, I thought it was this year, but no. Okay. There's two words I want you to, that you know of, but I don't know if you know how they work. It's called the solstice, right? The summer and winter solstice. And the fall and spring equinox. You can think of those terms as equator running this way, or actually the word equinox comes from the word equal. That's where... The daylight is equal to the darkness. They're the same on that day. The same light is in the same dark. That is what is called as the fall equinox and the spring equinox. The solstice is the shortest day, the winter solstice and the summer solstice. Depending on your hemisphere, depends on whether your solstice, winter solstice is like we experience or on the beach like Australia experiences. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, when the world was created, say created, created, it was created on a zero degree axis. It was straight up and down. Does everybody understand that? Mm-hmm. You ever heard of the canopy theory? Yeah. When the world was created, the world was created on a 23 degree axis. There was a canopy of water around the earth. They couldn't see the sun and the moon and the stars, but they knew something was there. Just like on a cloudy day, you know that there was something up there. It's light. And you know when it's not there, it's dark. There was no rain. There was the sun and moon were there to to govern the what seasons of time, but with uh, Earth on its reg- zero degree axis, the sun's over here. The it's going to be the same no matter. 
Plus, with a terrarium, the heat's going to bounce around on the inside. You don't have to water it. You don't have to, because there's no rain. God has caused the mist to come up. You understand all that, right? Okay. Okay. Then the flood came. God opened up the windows of heaven. What happens when you look out the windows? You can see through the barrier that has been blocking you to see what was up there. That's where the water from up there came down. And now they could see what was up there. Astronomy and astrology all started after the flood. When was the first cold and hot seasons? After the flood. Why was there hot and cold seasons? Because the earth went from a zero degree axis and tilted to a 23 degree axis, now creating seasons of weather. There were no seasons of weather like this, but now it changes. And that's why all human beings in times past had celebrations on the four different events. Winter solstice, spring equinox, summer solstice, and fall equinox. That's how they knew when to plant their crops. That's how they knew to harvest their crops. That's how they knew how to breed their animals. Everything worked around the equinox and the solstice, right? All holidays, just stop and think, we're going to do this real quick. All holidays or celebrations were based on solstices, spring uh, and, and equinoxes, fall equinox. What? Well, guess what was in the fall equinox? Can you say harvest? Oh, say the harvest equinox. That, that's when they harvest things. Is in the fall, and the closer you are to the equator, you got to remember where did everybody live at this time? Just above the equator, right in the Middle East. That was the known world, Mediterranean Sea. You know, so everything was based on all of this. And so there's multiple celebrations and different types of uh, customs that started. Uh, we're not going to get in tonight uh, the Adamic uh, laws that were started, the customs that were started. But like we talked about with Halloween, Halloween, throw the word away, the, the Essene calendar, when you understand the Essene calendar, you'll understand that the flood took place on the the fall equinox. And coming out of the flood, there was a celebration, there was a, I can't say a celebration. A remembrance. A, what? a remembrance of that God is not going to always deal with sin. It was the first thing was, okay, we're going to cel not celebrate. This is going to be a tradition marked to, as repentance for sin. We're going to, repentance is going to be on the, the forethought of our mind. And as time went by, it went from repenting of sin to being sorry for the ones that died and remembering the dead. Mm -hmm. As time went by, what God meant for him and repentance and honoring him it now went to remembering the dead. Mm -hmm. And then as time went by and Catholics got a hold of that, they, since so many people are dying, they said, well, we're just going to remember the saints that died. And so it became all Saints, saints Day, November 1st. First. First. It's all Saints, saints day. day. The evening before that is called All Hallows Eve. Eve. Now, because the Catholics who were manipulating things said the All Saints Day, they had bones of the saints and they began to charge people. Says, if you just pay us, we'll let you touch these bones and you'll get healed. Mm -hmm. And that's when manipulation of, of celebrations and things came into it. And then you had a group of people called the Druids who were in the scene. And the Druids were the ones that were really idolaters and pagans and, and uh, manipulated by the devil and the things that they were doing. And so... With that in mind that the Catholics were taking, cherishing these bones, and people would think, so they, they, they would take the bones of the sacrificed people that they would sacrifice, <laughs> and they would throw the bones, instead of selling them for healing, they would do just the opposite, and they would burn the bones in a fire, known as a oh. bone fire, which became in times, as time goes by, a... Bonfire. This is how customs get brought into different things, but it didn't. See, what I'm trying to tell you is don't throw out what God into, just throw out the paganism. Uh, listen, when it comes to Christmas, I don't care what day he was. 
Did, was Christmas, did, did they magnify the date Jesus was born in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? No. As far as the date. I mean, the event's there. But the date's not. In the first century church, was there any celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ? No. Now, there's a celebration of the Resurrection Day. The Jews were told to have these seven uh, practice feasts for the, uh, a big wedding that was going to happen. And it's the seven feasts, the spring and the fall feasts. See, what, 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 what? The spring and the... See, everything was based on the seasons. And so, you have all this stuff going on, and you, now you start getting people that are... Well, I forgot his name again. Constantine. Constantine. Well, it's a pagan. Christmas is a pagan holiday. Yo, don't, don't, don't. And, and so they isolate. I've actually had people leave my church, or when they candidating, checking me out if I was going, to, if they were going to come to our church, and they said, "Well, do you, what do you think about Christmas?" Yeah. Well, I got a lot of things to think about Christmas, but when they found we did anything at Christmas, they didn't come to church ever again. Because I mean, they didn't want nothing to do with it because we were celebrating a pagan holiday. I never cel did you? I didn't celebrate a pagan holiday. No, I celebrated my King and King and Lord of Lords. Yeah. I don't care what. They Listen, it's the it's a day when the world usually gives people off to be with family. Mm -hmm. What a great day. What a great day for the gospel to go forth. Yep. Mm -hmm. Even in Walmart, Macy's, the gospel's going forth in some degree of song somewhere. So what if they're not all Christian songs? What a day for the gospel to get out and evangelize the rest. They're sensitive right then and there to the birth of the Savior, Jesus Christ, and what He did. And we... we, we and that's why I'm saying... See, see, the devil really is using a lot of Christians to bring division in the body of Christ and not taking advantage of the opportunity because, listen, pagans didn't invent any days. God did. God created all days are God's days. And so there are just seven of them. Well, the pagans just don't worship what the pagans worship. Take it back. Take the rainbow back. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Take the truth of the rainbow back. Take the truth of Christmas back. Take the truth of Resurrection Day back. Take I don't care about Ishtar. I know that stuff. But it doesn't do anything in my heart. What does something in my heart is the resurrection of my Lord and Savior from the dead. Yeah. I don't want to be a Pharisee. See, if you, we're going to, tomorrow we're going to talk about all this stuff, okay? You don't want to miss it. You really don't. You know, I, I, I'm just, I'm loaded. <laughs> you don't understand how loaded I am right now. So I was supposed to not talk about any of that, actually. <laughs> so for the sake of everybody here, we're going to get into the, the inspirational part of the message. The mess is coming in the morning. And uh, turn with me to the book of Luke. Man, I tell you what. One or two. Luke chapter... One. Verse 26. Now, everybody knows this story, but we're going to read it and see what your Bible says. Now, in the sixth month, an angel of Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. Other than because it fulfilled a prophetic scripture, you know why God wants a virgin to do what she's never done? To, that, that, because God wants you to do something that you've never done. See, what I want you to do is put yourself in Mary's position here. God doesn't anoint the ones to do things that's already done it. He, 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 he calls the ones that haven't done it and anoints them so He can get the glory. You're not going, he doesn't want you to know how to do your ministry. Or you will do your ministry. <laughs> he wants someone who's never done his ministry. Okay? Now watch this. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Now, now i got to stop right here real quick. How many Bible nerds? Do we have any Bible nerds in here? People that just like little nuggets, little trinkets. Okay. Okay. We'll turn over to the book of Matthew real quick. Matthew chapter 1. And you have a long lineage of 
uh, of the genealogy of Christ. In verse 17, it breaks it down. Say breakdown. Break I didn't say break dancing. I said break down. Okay. It says, so all the generations from Abraham to David are what? 14. Say 14. 14. From David until captivity in Babylon, this, they're going through the history of the Jewish people. Okay? So from Abraham, right, to David were 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are what? 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon to Christ is what? 14, 14 generations. Now, I think that's awful cool. But it's cooler if you understand the point. Now, you've heard us share on this before, but turn over to Psalms 119. And if you look up the name David in any Strong's Concordance or anything in the Hebrew language, you'll see there's three letters that make up the word David. And in Psalms 119, you have all the Jewish letters and the numerical sequence that they fall into. In Psalms 119, if you're looking in your Bible, uh, right above number 1 or the word blessed, you should have a little symbol that looks like an N and an Aleph. That is the first letter and the first number in the Jewish alphabet. The entire Jewish alphabet is in Psalms 119 in numerical order. You got it? So the first letter is number 1, the second letter is number 2, the third letter is number See how deep this is? Okay? So, now, the three letters that are in the word David, the first one is number four. So you look down there, you see the Aleph. Look at verse 9, the Bet. Gamel is in 17. And the Daleth, look over here at the Daleth. That's number four. Oh, she's got it up there. It looks like a great big seven. Okay? It's number four, right? Well, there, there's three letters. One's a Dalif, one's a Vob, and one's a Dalif. So there's two number fours in the three letter word for David. The next letter after the Dalit is the Vob. It looks like a baby seven. Can I say that? It's the number six. So the first letter n number is four. The second is six. What do you get when you add six and four together? Ten. And the last letter is number four. T ten and four is what? Fourteen. So over here in the book of Matthew, Whoa. when it mentions the fourteen generations and fourteen generations, the fourteen, and Jesus is the after the lineage of David, he's after the lineage of fourteen. But that's not the point I'm trying to get at. Jesus was crucified on Nisan 14. Wow. See, this is Bible nerd stuff. See, that should get you excited to find out the connection. Now, what's the number 14? What's 2 divided by 14? Or 14 divided by 2? 7. 7 is the number of completion double. So, I mean, you can do this all day long in Scripture. Okay, back over here to the Christmas story. Seven days. Huh? Seven days. Seven days. Back to see seven. Everything's in sevens. Sorry, seven. And having come in, and I love this. And having verse twenty-eight, and having come in, the angel. So she's in a room, and he he came in to her. Says, "Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women." Did she hear what he said? Yes. Don't answer that. You will be wrong. But when she saw, say saw, saw, him, she was troubled at his saying and considered, hmm, what manner of greeting this is. Why? Because it wasn't normal. It sure wasn't. God is not going to speak to you normal. God is waiting for people to hear him outside of normal. Now, she didn't hear what he had said. Why? Next verse tells us. But when she saw him, he was she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. See, fear will keep you from hearing what 
She was thinking, what kind of greeting this is? She had just been told by the angel of the Lord, the Word of God. Say the Word of God. The Word of God, the word of God to her was that she was blessed and highly favored. She didn't hear that. She was, well, that's not normal. I didn't go to that church. They wouldn't have done that where I went to church. Don't even get me started. This has everything to do with you, by the way. Everything in Mary's life has everything to do with you. Including being a virgin. God is calling you to do something you've never done. That you're not equipped for. Because as Mary found out with God, all things are possible. Yeah. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid. How do we know Mary was afraid? Because the angel said she was. She had fear in her heart. The fear was keeping her from hearing God's Word. She wasn't focused on God's Word. She was focused on fear. How many people go to church hearing God's Word, but you're focused on fear because they've been preaching fear? How many denominations are preaching fear, judgment, wrath, condemnation, guilt, judgment? Yep. And they're making people afraid of God! Yep. Man, you're factoring fear in people. Then you have to, the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found what? Favor. What's favor? Let me ask you this. What's unmerited? Did she merit anything? So this was unmerited favor. You, you, anybody play Jeopardy? Can anybody do the... <laughs> Jeopardy is the opposite type of a game thing. They give you the answer and you've got to give them the question. Okay? Well, in Jeopardy it says, What is unmerited favor? Oh, I'm married to favor. And they'd say, uh, and the question would be, uh, what is grace? See, grace is what? I'm married to favor. If you know anything about what we share and teach, we teach about the grace of God. So what was it that took the fear out of our heart so she could begin to receive the Word of God into her heart? The grace message. Knowing that it doesn't matter what you've done, God's chosen you. Because of Jesus in her life, man. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for, I'm, for, for you have found favor with God. So the fear was gone, and she opened up her heart, and behold, now she's listening. This isn't normal. The fear is gone. She knows she has favor with God. Now it says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. <laughs> there it is. Mm -hmm. That number 14 jumps out again every time I read it. And he will reign over the house of Israel, Jacob forever. And the kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the, Holy, of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed Elizabeth, this is still the angel, now indeed Elizabeth, your relatives has also conceived a son in her old age. The birth of Jesus was not the miracle, people. The conception is. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And that's where we miss it. We're looking for the manifestation and we've never received the conception. Hmm. There has to be a conception. Hmm. Fear is taken out of your heart so you could receive. The Word of God is a seed planted. Just, just, the angel was giving Mary the seed of the Word of God. Tell, the word God was telling her what was going to happen in her life. And without fear, what does she say here? Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now her sixth month for, for her who was called barren. For with God, what? Yeah. Nothing yeah. is impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Now see, she's changed her mindset. You understand she was a little bitty girl in a little bitty place from a little bitty town with little bitty dreams 
of maybe getting married someday and having a man child. Mm -hmm. That's it. That, that was her future. Mm -hmm. And she's gone from that. The word of the Lord told her she was blessed, highly favored. The fear's gone in her heart. She now receives the word of God in her heart. And she says, be it unto me, as the word says. Amen. And see, that's what we have to do in our life. We hear the word of God. It speaks to us in our heart, not our head. This is what the Word says you can do. You can raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons. You can love the unlovable. You can be the, the maker of peace in unpeaceful situations. Blessed are the what? Peacemakers. Mm -hmm. that, that, I mean, okay, I'll say it this way. You can leap tall buildings in a single bound. You can be faster, more powerful than a locomotive. You know, you can stop bullets. For the, I mean, <laughs> you're super Christian. That's what the Bible says. That you can go through persecutions with joy. I mean, you can love the unlovable. You can love your enemies that hate you. You can bless them. You, you can look at people who not see male or female, rich or poor, black or white. There, there's no difference in the kingdom of heaven. That's the word of God for us. And she says this, be it unto me. Let it be to me according to your... How many of us say that? How, God, when I, your word says this. As I sleep tonight, be it unto me. Yeah. When I wake up in the morning... This is one of David's prayers. When I lay my head on the pillow and I wake up in the morning, may I be more like you. Yeah. Man. Do we have that kind of heart for the word of God being manifested, conceived in our heart? Because it, before it can manifest on the outside, it has to manifest on the inside, people. Mary just did, out comes Jesus. It was conceived. Then the process of germination, and, and uh, it, it just, the process begins to happen. She begins to, she, she flees. Right away it says, that the, now, now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill city with haste. As soon as she heard the angel say about Elizabeth, that, and she said, be it unto me, she got up and left. Now why did she go to Elizabeth? Like who baby. who was six months ahead of her in her own conception miracle? Mm -hmm. See, you can you can't afford to hang around what's normal. Mm -hmm. Come on. <laughs> you didn't get that, mm -hmm. Linda. Mm -hmm. You can't hang around mm -hmm. what's normal in the hood. Mm -hmm. Mary had a word of the Lord and she received it and it was conceived in her. She went to hang around someone that was ahead of her in the same type of miracle. Like-mindedness, like spirit, everything. Mary went and helped Elizabeth and Elizabeth helped Mary. Man, who you, when you, you ever been given a word of the Lord you told somebody and they said, nah, hey, that's not right. Now, guess what? You just aborted the word. Bye-bye. You hang around that. You know what's normal for Mary's life after she conceived? Yeah. Not being married? Stoning. Stoning. She had, to get, she had to get away from her family. Because they didn't believe. They wouldn't have believed. And if they would have, they would have had to stone her. Who you hang around. Now watch it. Just don't hang around. Watch this. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill city with haste to the city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias greeted and greeted Elizabeth. And, and it happened when Elizabeth heard. What she do? She heard the greeting of Mary. Not necessarily even saw her, but she heard. What happened here? The babe leaped in her womb. Now, wait a minute. I believe. Now, this is just me. I don't have. I wasn't there. But I believe that she was pregnant already six months. And I don't believe that she felt the baby move yet. Mm -hmm. That could be. And what she heard affected what was inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I can I can I milk that for a little bit? Amen. Can I just go that way? Yes. See, so you can have something on inside of you, mm -hmm. and what you hear 
will affect what's inside of you. Yeah. Maybe the baby heard too. Well, I'm sure it did. Yeah, mm-hmm. baby's going to believe. See, the Word of God. See, if you hear negative, what's inside of you might die. If you feel hear the law, say, you're free, liberty! And you hear bondage, law, guilt, and shame. What inside of you is going to be moved by what you hear. you got to protect the Word on the inside. So, look at this real simply. Elizabeth, ha, I, ha! <laughs> the old Jerry Clower. I don't know if y'all, y'all know who Jerry Clower is up here. I don't know. Ah! The baby. Woo! The baby. Ah, ah, what, and what did she say? She said, and uh, 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 she heard one. And Elizabeth was filled with what? The Holy Spirit. Now, what was the first manifestation of being filled with the Holy Spirit here, people? Listen to this. She was what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she what? Spoke She spoke it. Real quiet voice? A loud voice. Allow. Then she spoke with a loud voice. And you wonder why some people around here are loud. <laughs> you shout at your own. <laughs> <laughs> then she spoke with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women. Who told her Mary was blessed? Holy she wasn't there. But she had what is known as a word of knowledge. So you have the gifts of the Spirit manifesting right before your very eyes. They didn't have to wait to the book of Acts. She was filled with the Holy Spirit and the first thing that came out was a word of knowledge. Oh, you're blessed. You're highly... Oh, let's just read what it says. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women. <laughs> That's what the angel told Mary. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. How'd she know she was pregnant? The Holy, the Holy Spirit. These are words of knowledge after she was filled with instantly. She didn't have to go to school of the prophets. <laughs> but why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Who said she was pregnant with the Lord, the Son of God? The Spirit did. The, did she really know that she, she was... I really believe that that was a sign of life. I really do. I no, Listen to me. I Don't go preaching. I just believe that. That that was proof of life. He leaped for joy. Blessed is she who believed. What, was she blessed if she would have believed? Listen to this. This is, this is coming from the Holy Spirit through the mouth of Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. Blessed is she who believed for there, I like to say now will be. For there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told to her from the Lord. Mm-hmm. If she wouldn't have believed, would she be blessed among women? No. Say, God's made a way for all men to be saved, but only to them that Believe. believe. If she wouldn't have believed, I really believe there'd be a Virgin Jane, Virgin Sue, virgin or another Virgin. <laughs> another Virgin. Sure. Elizabeth, I, I just, for some reason, I've caught before, just her humility. You know, basic, why would you come to me? You know, so she was able to be a vessel to give the word of the Lord because of her humility. And as Brad, I think someone said over here, she knew that Mary wasn't married. That she had conceived out of wedlock. And now you have these two people that have a miracle conception feeding one another in their walk until the manifestation. When did Mary leave Elizabeth? right after Elizabeth gave birth to John the Baptist. And she was three months pregnant because Elizabeth was six months pregnant. So she was three months pregnant with the word that was in her heart. Did she have to tell anybody that she was pregnant with a child? Or did they see it? Got a question. Do you have the word in your heart? 
Can people see it? Mm -hmm. Or do you have to tell, well, I'm praying. No, she wouldn't have told anybody if they could see it was. Mm. Was the most natural, that was a normal thing to do. Mary coming home from a different place and the the man that she was going to be married didn't go with her and she comes back pregnant. Mm. Stoner. Mm -hmm. But Joseph, say Joseph. Well, let's go back into Mary's song here for a second. Look what it says here in verse 46. And Mary said, after, after it says, Blessed is she who believed for thou that be fulfillment of all the things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. When did her soul magnify the Lord? It tells us, And my spirit has rejoiced in my God, my Savior. Man, what's a power for a little 13 year old girl? This is powerful. My soul magnifies. Psalms 34 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. If you can magnify God, you can demagnify God. I believe with all my heart any teaching that teaches that Jesus, God, and the Holy Ghost don't do today what they did back then is a false Luciferian doctrine. Period. In these last days, not God's not trying to get smaller. He's trying to show off bigger. The goodness of God. Romans says, Romans chapter 2, verse 4 says, the goodness of God will draw all men to what? Repentance. Repentance, not guilt, fear, and condemnation. And hell! So Mary comes back. Verse 46. You need to read Mary's song. She's excited. Verse 40. Tell me if her little mindset hadn't changed. Mm -hmm. My spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. See, it happens in the spirit, it happens in the soul, and then you're going to dance on the outside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get the she was happy. Mm -hmm. For he has regarded the lowly state of his hand, his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations have called me blessed. Don't you think she had some revelation? She just got confirmation that what the angel told her was going to happen, happened, and Elizabeth is proof of it. And now, yes, everybody's going to call me blessed. The sad thing is, they're going to worship her too. Anyway, we won't get there. For he as mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And i tell you what, just read her song. Look over here, verse 46, And Mary remained with her about three months, Remember, she was six. Elizabeth six what, months, fifty-six. Elizabeth was six months pregnant. Stayed three months. Three months. Three and six is what? Nine. John the Baptist is born, and Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her house. She didn't have to tell anybody that she was pregnant. She was showing it. This is where Joseph comes into the picture. If you look over in Matthew chapter. Chapter 1, verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus was as follows after His mother Mary. Um, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows after His mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph before they came together. Does everybody, do, I, do I need to explain that? In other words, they were betrothed, but they hadn't consummated their marriage. Right? That's important for you to understand. She was found with child, <laughs> duh, of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he, was, while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to, make, uh, to take to you Mary, your wife, uh, for that which is conceived, say conceived, in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he... Now, there's a powerful statement right here. Uh, he, will save, he will save his people from their sins. sins. I'll let the Holy Spirit teach you that. So all this was done that it, it might be fulfilled which what was spoken uh, of the Lord, the, the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear his son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Okay? So now let's go back over to Luke chapter 
2, verse 17. Now, this is where we're going to mess up your Christmas story. Is that okay? You want to know what the Bible has to say about some things? Silent night. <laughs> and it came to pass in those days, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governor in Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone his own city. Joseph also went up to Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth in Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. David. He had, if they would have sold that, that town, he would have got part of the proceeds. He had lineage rights. He had every right to stay in the home he went to. Now, let's listen to this. Joseph also went to Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his what? Betrothed wife who was with child. Two things work against him right now because if you know anything about Amish culture, if you do something against their culture that's contrary, you'll, you'll be called shunned. In Israel, they have the same type of thing that takes place. The word that we found out, uh, it really, to a higher degree, means you're just... But there's a shunning. Uh, see, Mary was in sin. According to them. According to the law, Mary was in sin. sin. She had sex outside of marriage and was with a child outside of marriage. That makes her untouchable. She was shunned. Because he received her in that condition, he now is shunned and in the same sin. In other words, their families can't help them. So when they went to Bethlehem, and it says they are, there's no room in the inn, it does not mean that they were full. Two things work against him. They were shunned for their sin, and also, even if they're not shunned, if the pregnancy, if a woman's pregnant, that she can be in the house while they're pregnant, but when it comes time to give birth, she has to leave the house because there's blood involved in the preg in the birthing process and makes the whole house unclean. Oh, and everybody in the house is unclean. Mm -hmm. So when you bring the customs back into it, it's not because there's no room in the inn and they didn't show up one night and start looking. Let's read what it says. <laughs> Verse 6. So it was that while they were there, yeah, they had been there they'd already been there a while. Mm -hmm. So it was while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. They had been there for days, waiting for the time to give birth. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in Oh, because there is no room for them in the Okay, we're going to talk. This one verse is just going to take probably the rest of the evening. Uh, we'll see if we can't hurry this up. This is what's so, so really cool. When a, when a priest, uh, the, the priest would wear garments into the temple. When those garments became to the point where it wasn't worthy for the temple, they would tear the priest's garments in strips. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm. cool. Those strips would be taken to a place outside of Bethlehem called the Migdal Adair. Oh. The Migdal Adair is where the Passover lambs were raised for sacrifice. When the Passover lambs that were perfect were, re were being born, they would wrap them in swaddling cloth from the priest's, from the priest's garment that had been served in the temple. Because oh, that's, so that's where the lamb is going back to. Mm. Wow. Dang it, boy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're loaded for tomorrow morning. Don't, you don't... We're loaded. 
You don't understand. Say McDollar It's going to change. Let's and, and, and why did they wrap it up in, in the swaddling cloth? Because when, when something is born like a lamb, there's a lot of thrashing that takes place. And so they would wrap the lamb. Now, now there's two words. There's one is swaddling cloth and swaddling clothes. There's only E difference in our language. But the one is babies would be wrapped in swaddling clothes. Oh, but well, he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. Cloth. Uh-huh. You're loving this. I know you are. Yes. Can I ask a question before tomorrow? Yes. <laughs> what I missed it. Why did the Why did the priest rip his clothes again? I missed that. Because they weren't uh, They weren't worthy. They, they were. They became. Unusual. They had to be perfect for service. Everything had to be perfect in the temple for service. It's like okay. recycling clothes for cleaning. Right? So they were just an old. So they they did not qualify to be worn. Even the the high priest uh, underwear was one piece of garment with no seams in it. That's how immaculate everything was. So when it came to the point of being worn, they would get new clothes, take their old clothes, put them in strips, and send those to the Megdal Adair. Now, stop. Now, here's what I... I almost, i, I got to get into some of this. T- turn with me to the book of Numbers. I want you to see that this is in the Word, and I'm just not making this up. If I did, I'd be a really good maker-upper. And and uh, uh, chapter. I'm sorry. Uh, chapter twenty-eight. This is in the book of Numbers, verse three. And you shall say to them, "This is the offering made by fire, which you shall offer to the Lord to everybody say two, two. male lambs in their first say first, first. year without blemish." Talking about sacrificial lambs for, wait a minute, day by day as a regular. Now, let me tell you what this is saying. In a Jewish calendar, there's 360 days. There's two sacrifices of lamb per day. One in the morning, one in the evening. It's called a tamid offering. The word to mean means continual. That there is a continual offering that's being taken place. One in the morning, one in the evening for 360 days. Times two is 720 spotless, blemish-free lambs in one year minimum. That's not including all the other sacrificial lambs that everybody else had to sacrifice. All, if you know anything about Bethlehem, it was known the house of bread. All the lambs, all the sheep, all the sacrifices that the temple, the only sacrifices the temple would receive for sacrifice came from Bethlehem. Just think of the herd of sheep. Quit thinking little when it comes to the birth of Jesus Christ and back in those days. They had to have 720 perfect. These weren't... Tomorrow morning, we're going to get more in detail, but have you ever heard this? Well, God chose the lowliest of the lows, the shepherds, to announce the coming of His sheep, the Lamb of God. You ever heard that? Again, if you've been around us any length of time, you learned at least one Latin word. And that Latin word that fits that scenario is bulimus craptimus. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow morning, we're going to learn who the shepherds were, what the shepherds were, what did the shepherds know that most people probably knew but forgot, what were they looking forward to, and why did God pick the shepherds? To be the first after 400 silent years. You need to understand that between Malachi, the, the last book of the Old Testament and the first book of the New Testament, there's a page in your Bible that says four. Listen, those four, I, I, I wish I knew 20 years ago what I know now about those 400 silent Those 400 silent years are chalked. Yep. 
Oh, my! What the church doesn't know about those 400 silent years. Just with Roman history. Let alone Babylonian history. That's 288,000 spotless lambs. In how long? 400 years. How about all the time that they were... How about all the time that they were... Do you, do you think that was a big herd? Come on, people. You think they were just... Uh, 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 shepherd. Um, just, just for a second, before we get into the 400 silent years, tomorrow you'll learn that the, the, the shepherds were Levitical shepherds. Do you know what Levitical means? They're from the tribe of... That means they didn't qualify within their own tribe to be a priest. So if you had a defect of any kind, like a facial defect, there's one arm longer than the others, there's a whole list of things that would disqualify from you being a priest even if you were born in the tribe of Levi. So what job did you have being in the tribe, the priestly tribe of Levi, if you couldn't be a priest? You were a Levitical shepherd that raised the lambs that were perfect lambs that were going to be the sacrifice for all of Jerusalem to a day. Including and then the Passover lamb at the end. These shepherds were the shep the best of the best of the best shepherds. They knew more than any other shepherd. These weren't average everyday. Listen, these shepherds knew how to look for a perfect lamb. They knew how to take care of a perfect lamb. They expected perfect lamb. They're the ones that told the rest of the world that it's perfect. They had to certify. I've got a guy working on it. Maybe some of you can help me with this. In America, we'd call that USDA approved. <laughs> Bonafide. Bonafide. <laughs> Brother, where art thou now? I know what you been watching. Bonafide. So there's got to be a Israel form of USDA approved. Something like... Kosher. Kosher. <laughs> what, I don't know. Yeah. Someone come up with something that sounds like USDA. Okay? These shepherds knew what they. Uh, there's only one place, and tomorrow morning we're going to get into the history of the Migdal Adair. It's going to blow you away. We did a little bit of this last uh, Resurrection Day. We talked about Jesus being the Passover Lamb, and we went back into history, back to the Migdal Adair, showing how he he was the Passover Lamb out of the Migdal Adair. I imagine the manger was pretty close to it. The manger was the Migdal Adair. Yeah. <laughs> Matter of fact, when we read this, oh, did I not read the? Yeah, I read that. Let's go back over the book of Luke. You need to talk about A or the. The what? A or the. Yeah, we're going to. Uh, chapter 2, verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, which we talked about, and laid him in. Manger. Get rid of the word of. In the Greek, that word a uh, is the manger. It's a definite article. It's called a definite article. It's not subject for searching out through Bethlehem. We'll get into this in the morning because it's already getting too late. But you need to understand, there was a the manger that every shepherd knew what the manger was. It was indeed so you, just, just read what this says. Lay him in the manger because there is no room for him in what is known as the cataluma. That word in is the Greek word for cataluma. Say cataluma. Is there another story in the book of Luke that talks about an inn? Oh, good thing you brought it up. I never would have thought of it. Luke chapter 10. The story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan takes the person that was beat up by the, the was, had, that he had mercy on, put the oil in the wine, put him on his donkey, which is a sign of peace, took him to the inn. Okay, you don't, let me just read it to you. Look what it says here. That that word is uh, ponde hio. Okay? That? That's in verse 35. of Luke chapter 10. And the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave it to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him. Oh, verse 34. And when he went into the, uh, bandaged him, his wounds poured out. Now we talked about this. This is all about Jesus finding mercy on, on us, pouring in oil and wine and two-thirds of all Jesus' ministry was, was healing. 
poured an oil on wine and set him on his own animal, brought him to an yeah. point of dia, uh, Pondihion. That is a room for a stranger. It's like a hotel room. That is different than Cataluma. Cataluma literally means guest chamber. This guest chamber is a special room reserved for family coming to visit. No one put family in a pond high on. They put them in the Cataluma. David had every right to be in the Cataluma in the Joseph. house. Hmm? I mean, Joseph had every right to be in the Cataluma with Mary. But they had been shunned. And again, she was going to be unclean giving birth. So there was no place. When it says no room for her, like, oh, we're filled up, sorry. He was not welcome. She, she did, they didn't want her there. No vacancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no vacancy. Uh, you know, Cousin Billy, it's not like Cousin Billy was already on the couch <laughs> and the, all the other beds full because family reunion, you know, big sense is coming into town. No, they're, they're, they had been shunned. Man, that, that changed. They'd already been there for days. It came time for her to be delivered. And where does she go to be delivered? The Migdala The Migdala The same place the Passover lambs were to be. Oh. Where the swaddling cloths were stored, waiting. Where the shepherds knew without any question. Listen, what did the angel tell the shepherds? You'll find the babe wrapped in, <coughs> lying in the manger. manger. So they knew where. There's only one Migdala Dare that the Passover lambs were birthed in, just outside of Bethlehem. And tomorrow morning, we're going to get deep into that. We're going to go back all the way to the book of Genesis to show you God's plan for His Passover lamb. Man, I have no idea what time it is. It's so, 9.30 almost. So let, let me quit trying to do that. We will pick this up tomorrow there. What we need to understand, there's 400 silent years in between the old last book. And why they call it silent years, even though it wasn't silent, it means not recorded. Then God didn't speak. God didn't speak for 400 years. The first message that comes out of heaven after 400 silent years was glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. Yes. Goodwill. Toward all men. Yeah. Peace was declared. See, the children of Israel weren't scared of the devil. They were scared of God. Look at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1. Look what this says. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is over. See, God loved man, but He hated sin. And the children of Israel couldn't stop sinning. But He loved man, but He hated sin. So He sent a Savior dressed up as a lamb. Coming back as a king. That her warfare is ended. Her iniquity is pardoned. For she has received from the Lord's hand Double four. Double four. Not eye for an eye. Fourteen. <laughs> Not eye for an eye. Fourteen, yeah. But double. Yeah, your sins were paid double for what you've done. You know, we hear this word, the gospel of peace. Shod, in the book of Ephesians it says, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. peace. We hear that, but do we know what it is? How about in the book of Romans where it says the greatest salvation man, if you believe in the Lord, you confess with your mouth, you should be what? Saved. And how will they believe unless they've not heard? How will they hear unless there's not a preacher? What's a preacher supposed to preach when he, when he, when he goes to preach? Peace. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. peace. Kindness of God. See, the world is full of fear like Mary, Joseph, and the shepherds. And peace has to be established before they'll receive the word into their hearts. 
As long as the church is pumping out fear of God, they'll never have a heart that will receive the Word of God. Man. Faith comes by what? Hearing. That's in Romans chapter 10 too. And hearing comes by the what? Word of God. What Word of God? The book of Leviticus? Mm-hmm. Or the Gospel of Peace? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jehovah Shalom. Mm-hmm. The Gospel of Peace. Look at, look at Isaiah 54 verse 9. Isaiah 54 verse 9. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed. Has God established a covenant of peace? Absolutely. The first message after 400 silent years that came to the earth was a message of peace between God and man that He was going to deal with the problem of sin so He could be peace. Why does this have to happen? I'll show you why. Turn to James chapter 3, verse 18. James chapter 3, verse 18 says this. Now the fruit of righteousness... Say fruit. fruit. Every fruit has a seed in it. And every seed reproduces after what? Its own kind. Now the fruit or the seed of righteousness is sown... God had to declare peace on earth so He could plant the seed, Jesus, of righteous, our righteousness, His righteousness, in the ground so He could bring forth more of the same kind. That's us. Peace had to be established on earth so the seed of righteousness could be placed in the ground and die and bring forth more of the same kind. Merry Christmas. Father, we thank you for this opportunity you give us to gather together in this place. Holy Spirit, you're the great teacher. We simply ask that you do what you do best. Open the eyes of our understanding. Bring to us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of your word. And all God said, Amen. Amen. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support also helps us to continue to share this message of grace, peace, and Christ's righteousness in the finished work of the cross. You can give online at cokerministries.com or you can mail your support to or prayer requests to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parkers Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. Remember, if you are in Christ, you are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed.